Good evening. I apologize in advance for the temperature. Uh, we're told it's under, <laughs> under study, but I think I said it's sufficient to simply stop piping any air of, uh, uh, at all. I, maybe we should reverse this event and go out into the forum of democracy outside, or at least the image of one, and move the wine in here to chill down for um, the refreshments afterwards. Anyway, I'm Barry Bergdahl, uh, curator uh, here in the Department of Architecture and Design at MoMA and also professor of art history at Columbia. Uh, and so, therefore, represent uh, in myself uh, the bringing together that we want to celebrate tonight of a collaboration, an ongoing collaboration, really, but one that's taken on really consequential uh, dimensions uh, between the university and the museum uh, with the uh, taking over the stewardship of the Frank Lloyd Wright archive and soon to be joined by the archives of the Ateliers and Associates uh, coming in subsequent um, let's say, shipments to, uh, to New York. Uh, that has been an uh, incredible adventure with our colleagues from the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. Sean Malone, the chief executive officer uh, is, of the foundation, is here tonight. We've had a day of discussions about the future evolution of the, um, the projects that can emerge uh, from the uh, new accessibility uh, of the archive here in its location in Manhattan between university uh, and museum. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, with our colleagues at the School of Architecture and uh, uh, most particularly at the uh, Avery Library, Carol Ann Fabian and Janet Parks are here as well. Together with them, uh, I curated the, this first glimpse of the uh, archive. We decided uh, upstairs, I hope you've all had a chance to see it, Frank Lloyd Wright and the City, Density versus Dispersal. We decided that it would be uh, a way of opening up the issue of right to welcome him back to New York by tackling head on uh, his ambivalent attitudes uh, towards the urban developments of 20th century America and to ask the questions that seem to be conceivably, but uh, our speaker tonight, Ira Katz Nelson, tells me he is not so sure anymore. Uh, conceivably a contradictory attitude uh, towards uh, this extending the city as found and trying fundamentally to reform uh, and rethink it. Uh, and so in that exhibition, we tried to bring together two laboratories, one the laboratory of Broadacre City, the other the ongoing laboratory of how one might perfect the one of the great building uh, the types that America had given to the world, the high-rise office building, the skyscraper. That seemed to me uh, at least a tension, and I wanted to create an exhibition that had a hypothesis that didn't achieve an answer. And it seemed to me that a hypothesis that didn't achieve an answer was a way of opening up both to the audiences that come to the Museum of Modern Art. If you've been in the, uh, in the exhibition in the last few days, it must be Easter vacation somewhere. I guess they never end in Europe. Um, the show is filled with people, and they stay, and they talk, and they are fixated on the Broadacre model, and of course, the absolutely fantastic uh, drawings. And uh, although we don't record what we say, we are imagining that they're having conversations uh, with uh, Wright. Perhaps what the German romantics called at the birth of the museum, the idea of the museum as the instigator of a Kunstkonversation, uh, in which two visitors and a work of art were engaged in a conversation. There's no better way to do that than to couple with a university not only its library resources, but also its uh, academic departments and particularly the centers that bring together in interdisciplinary work uh, the possibilities of cross-fertilizing uh, disciplinary investigations. And I think in, in recent years, the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture has been doing exactly that. Uh, we've had previous uh, very exciting and open-ended and provocative collaborations with Reinhold Martin, the director, and the uh, others at the Buell Center, uh, notably the um, somewhat controversial, much debated exhibition Foreclosed, Rehousing the American Dream, two years ago. Uh, and so the Buell Center was poised, uh, really, to act very, very immediately on the arrival of the uh, 
Frank Lloyd Wright materials in New York to see what kinds of new questions might be asked uh, in parallel to those that we wanted to uh, open up through the practice of exhibition. So Reinhold very uh, quickly agreed that the spring event would at least take a tangent through the Frank Lloyd Wright exhibition and bring the ongoing research of the Buell Center on housing and on issues of democracy of the public uh, and the like to bear uh, on uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright material. Certainly democracy is something that preoccupied Wright in his sometimes profound, sometimes incredibly idiosyncratic uh, ways. Uh, and it seemed to us, rather than go back to a tried and true Wright specialist, we would ask a colleague who we know is always open to new ventures and daring, uh, Ira Katz Nelson, whose book, Fear Itself, here we're in fear of the cold, but fear itself much more profound, uh, has opened up re uh, thinking about the New Deal, and that was indeed the environment, the political context uh, in which uh, Wright articulated this urban vision, although as we've discovered, uh, it went on to be a laboratory for the next uh, 30 years. So without much more ado, I just wanted to say this is for us the type of occasion that uh, celebrates what the university and the museum can bring together to open up the archive, not only to scholars and to homeowners and to people who want to have access to those materials uh, without venturing to Arizona and Wisconsin, although we hope that they still will, but there they can focus on the work that the foundation is focusing on in, in the buildings, uh, but also uh, to open it up to our own debates on the issues that really matter to us, not only as historians and scholars, but also as citizens. So it seemed a perfect occasion uh, to do that and to uh, hear from Ira Katz Nelson, who will be introduced by my colleague Reinhold Martin. Thanks, Barry. Um, and yes, I suppose I represent the bee uh, here uh, in this collage or montage of logos. Um, and I'm here to tell you uh, about the one in the middle, the SSRC, represented by our colleague Ira Katz Nelson. Um, but before I do that, I first of all want to thank uh, yet again all the many collaborators who, in the different uh, in their different roles, have have helped pull this uh, event together and the conference with which it's attached together, and, and particularly Jacob Moore, program coordinator, coordinator at the Buell Center. There he is, Jacob, uh, for his absolutely tireless uh, organization and imagination uh, in in helping uh, and in really bringing everything together, and 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 to Brett Taborada uh, here at MoMA and, and our many colleagues and friends here in our, as Barry said, ongoing uh, collaborations to which. Uh, we look forward um, in the uh, immediate and long uh, future as well. I, I guess I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, as listening to Barry, I kind of feel like I have to explain something about this image as he's talking about Frank Lloyd Wright. And, and in some ways, that's, that's the, the, the sort of brief remarks that I wanted to add to Barry's um, uh, opening remarks uh, are, are some effort uh, in that general direction. So. Um, now, the title of the Buell Center Conference, uh, for which uh, Ira's talk will strike the keynote, um, is, the, the, as you see, the figure of democracy, houses, housing, uh, and the polis. Um, now, uh, just by current academic protocol, the title really should have been uh, figures, plural, uh, of democracy, um, <clears throat> uh, to emphasize that no single political entity, uh, least of all the United States, exercises sole proprietorship uh, over uh, the term and that in fact democracy can and has been figured uh, in political discourse, aesthetic discourse, as well as in the polis itself. So I think it's entirely appropriate that we're discussing here, here in, at the Museum of Modern, Modern Art, because this is at some level an aesthetic question as much as it is a uh, social and political one. Um, so um, I'm, I'll leave it to you uh, to infer why we've allowed, to, allowed it to remain in the singular. Suffice it to say, that when in any given historical situation, the demos, the people, uh, is coupled with the oikos, uh, the household, um, uh, or as democracy and housing uh, are put together, we are inevitably confronted with the interplay of universal claims and particular situations. Uh, and really it's that kind of interplay that the conference is going to explore in a variety of ways uh, tomorrow. Now among the universals who have enjoyed something of a rebirth of late, uh, is, uh, and this, you know, I think is visualized here, is the Lefebvrean right to the city. 
uh, in a self-described democratic society founded on political, if not natural or universal rights, um, <clears throat> uh, this can simply translate uh, into, among other things, the right to housing. And, and again, the, the, that problematic is constituted a good deal of what the Buell Center, uh, both historically and in the present, has been uh, dealing with in our different modes. Um, now, or at least um, the right to fair housing, decent housing maybe, um, or in today's uh, rather more economistic language, affordable housing. Uh, so it's entirely appropriate, um, uh, not planned, but appropriate, uh, that we convene here uh, four days after New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio unveiled his uh, rather ambitious new affordable housing policy, about which maybe you've been reading. Um, now, although some of us might prefer that such policies grant renewed dignity to the term public housing uh, in place of the uh, apologetic and perhaps developer-friendly affordable housing, um, Mayor de Blasio's program represents an important departure from the status quo. Uh, and I have to say, when we were doing the foreclosed project, it's, you know, we really were uh, in a sense, saying that such a thing was going to be very difficult to imagine, even in New York. So it's, it's, it's a welcome uh, change. Um, so much so, in fact, that the New York Times editorial board, while applauding the mayor's ambition, felt the need to fret a bit uh, over whether all those new units for all those people who cannot otherwise afford to inhabit our polis, or city, uh, might put undue pressure on our subways and other infrastructures. Uh, so, to the extent that shared infrastructures like the ancient agora from, form the backbone, or, you know, public space, uh, form the backbone of anything like a democratic city, uh, that is, a city founded in, in principle at least, on equality uh, rather than inequality, uh, this preemptive objection shows how far we still have to go. For, as we know, uh, there wasn't really a problem in extending Manhattan's number seven subway line to serve the luxurious new Hudson Yards, um, the uh, uh, imagining and paying for new infrastructures to service the city's dispossessed remains somehow a bit more troublesome. Uh, so to be sure, according to its developers, Hudson Yards, among many such developments in the city, recently will include something like 25% of affordable units. Um, uh, but that means, of course, uh, that the other 75 will be, strictly speaking, unaffordable. Now, uh, technicalities aside, um, a truly democratic polis uh, cannot be built on such inequality. Uh, to understand something of how this came to be, I invite you to come tomorrow uh, to, the, to the conference up, up at Columbia. Uh, I also take the opportunity to invite those of you, any of you who may be in Venice during the opening two weeks of the Biennale in June, uh, to visit Columbia's Casa Moraro near the Peggy Guggenheim Foundation. Um, the newly publicized Peggy Guggenheim Foundation, uh, to see the Buell Center's small off-program exhibition, uh, House Housing. <clears throat> it's not part of the biennial. It's a kind of response to it, in a sense. House Housing, an untimely history of architecture and real estate in 19 episodes, uh, which forms a sort of backdrop to this week's uh, conference, this weekend's conference, sorry. Now, as Barry mentioned, uh, the elegant afterimage of Frank Lloyd Wright um, hanging in the galleries upstairs uh, forms another backdrop uh, to, to the conference. Now, Wright uh, I, you know, didn't really much like subways, I think. Uh, however, however, we must acknowledge his profuse, uh, if occasionally befuddling, occasionally amusing, and occasionally rather suggestive um, uses of the term democracy. Uh, Wright also didn't much like uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, uh, or at least the forms that it, had, that it was taking. Uh, and partly to show that he could do it better, uh, and partly to keep his interns busy, he designed and exhibited Broadacres, or Broadacre City, the majestic model uh, of which I hope you've already seen upstairs. And, and if you haven't, please do as soon as you possibly can, because it's only going to be up there for what, yeah, a couple, another few more weeks. So uh, Now, although um, not by chance Wright didn't design much housing, he did, of course, design many houses, uh, some of which, including the more modest uh, one-car allotments his team uh, incorporated into Broadacres, uh, were even affordable to a suburbanizing middle class, if not to an urban working class. Ira Katznelson uh, uh, is a figure whose equally majestic work uh, gives us an invaluable context uh, within which to consider such matters. Um, 
in public discourse, now it's, it, this is a very funny thing, I don't know, I, I always have a hard time with this, but it's, it's a peculiar commonplace to refer to university professors by their affiliation, uh, as in Harvard Professor X or Yale Professor Y. Um, but I must say that the appellation is especially suited to Columbia Professor uh, Ira Katznelson. Um, <clears throat> for Ira is and has been for some 20 years uh, an extraordinarily respected presence on the Columbia campus where he is Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History, and, and in fact, much more. Uh, a graduate of Columbia College with a PhD from Cambridge, uh, Ira has not one but two teaching careers. Uh, he has had not one but two teaching careers at Columbia, um, in between which he has taught at the University of Chicago and at the New School, where he served as dean of the graduate school before returning to Columbia in 1994. His most recent book, uh, mentioned by Barry, which has been widely praised and, and was just awarded, in fact, the, the prestigious Bancroft uh, Prize by Columbia's Board of Trustees, is the ominously titled, uh, and for the most part, I think, duly ominous, uh, Fear Itself, uh, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time of 2013. There you can read in vivid prose a fresh, challenging account of a period and a process that you thought you'd already understood. Uh, written from the unlikely perspective of the United States Congress uh, rather uh, than the chief executive, and with a steady eye on the racial politics that divided the country and forced uh, unsavory compromises. Uh, it's not only Mr. Roosevelt's New Deal, but also our own uh, that Ira repositions uh, in the book uh, as he draws out the threads that connect past and present. Now, if that alone was, was, wasn't enough to confirm the fittingness of his opening our conference, uh, and were we to seek more deeply into the history of inequality in America, uh, his influential 2005 book, uh, When Affirmative Action Was White, An Untold History of Racial Inequality in 20th Century America, would be required reading. With its beautiful, troubling formulation of what he calls Du Bois's paradox, a really beautiful uh, figure, um, in which African Amer and, 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 and profoundly disturbing, in which African Amer Americans are excluded from New Deal democratic reforms, especially in relation to education and labor practices. If we wanted to pursue that, the matter on more urban grounds, we might begin with his earliest work, as far as I know, earliest work, <laughs> Black Men, White Cities uh, on Race and Migration in Early 20th Century, uh, early, early 20th century U.S. and Postwar Great Britain. Um, published in 1973, at a time, incidentally, uh, if you think about it, 1973, uh, at a time when most architectural historians writing about cities seem not yet to have read Franz Fanon, uh, to whom its title uh, um, manifestly refers. And if we wanted to put it all back into the context of the 20th century's single most consequential urban analytic, we would surely need to take up the lucid and finely balanced Marxism in the City of 1992. Uh, written, again, it must be said, at a time when most architectural historians uh, had left that particular conjunction for dead uh, in search of more playful postmodern terrain. There, for example, readers may embark on a critical journey through Marxist urban theory uh, with a youngish uh, Friedrich Engels as their guide, uh, um, assiduously picking their way through the thorny thickets uh, in which the ground war uh, between po political economic structures and human agency is still waged. Now, the list of titles uh, authored, co-authored, and edited goes on, including decisive works on liberalism, on war, on religion, and indeed, on democracy. As does the list of honors, Guggenheim Fellow, American Academy of Arts and, Arts and Sciences, uh, American Philosophical Society, um, and so on, uh, and leadership positions, the most recent of which is the presidency of the Social Science Research Council, the SSRC, um, the logo in the middle which Ira took up in, in 2012. Uh, this prodigious responsibility has uh, made him more fugitive from Columbia's trenches than many of us uh, would have liked. Um, nevertheless, he can still be found trekking back uptown from the SSRC's offices in Brooklyn to advise on matters large and small uh, to universal benefit. I mentioned this last uh, since it is, I presume, from the SSRC's recently announced initiative on the decent city. Uh, that Ira's talk tonight translates its title, if not its full scope. Uh, for, for his full title also enjoins us to recall the themes of his most recent book, with which I began, uh, the, the title of the talk uh, being 
The Decent City, Reflections on the Architecture of Fear. And it is with this in mind, fear, uh, that I ask you to please join Barry and me in welcoming our esteemed colleague, Columbia professor, Ira Katznelson. Well, uh, that was an extraordinarily generous introduction. Uh, thanks to you, Ryan, Reinhold, and thank you, Barry, um, not just for both of you, for your colleagueship and leadership, um, but for putting up with a, inviting a rank amateur to open a conference um, uh, on, uh, sponsored by these two great organizations, um, concerned, among other things, with, with architecture. When I, when I agreed, after agreeing to do this, one of the first memories that came to mind um, concerns a moment when I was some, literally 30 years ago, so I was young enough to be truly foolish. Um, I received a call one day sitting at my desk from a woman who represented herself as from the Royal Academy of Arts in, in London. And she reported to me that there would be an exhibition mounted soon on German art in the 20th century. And would I please deliver a keynote address um, to an international symposium of art historians and critics? And of course, my immediate response was, oh, you have the wrong person. Um, and she said no, that she'd read an essay of mine on urban social theory. And wouldn't I talk about images of the urban in German expressionist art? Now, I, I knew I'd seen Kirchner or Meidner and so on, but I, I, I um, did I know much about German expressionism? No. So I spent about six weeks um, with piles of catalogs on my desk, and one day our then 12-year-old daughter, who's now in her early 40s, um, uh, said to me, Daddy, what are you doing? And I said, I'm preparing a talk on, um, on German expressionist art. And with all the gusto of a 12-year-old, she said, Daddy, about that, you know nothing. Um, well, I, I have, you would have thought that 30 years later, um, uh, you know, <laughs> here I am in a great museum talking about a subject that's some distance from my expertise. Uh, one might have thought I should have learned, but here we are. Now, my subject this evening is, as it says, uh, what is a decent city? Um, reflections on the architecture of fear. And what I have to say actually uh, took shape um, when, in early March, uh, Barry Bergdahl guided me through the remarkable exhibition that he and colleagues have curated up on the third floor in the architecture and design uh, galleries. And the thoughts that were generated as we moved through Frank Lloyd Wright and the city density versus dispersal gave me the courage to move away from my original intention when I'd been invited to reflect on the themes in my recent book and how they might um, shape our understanding of uh, urban design in a period of fear, um, to talk more directly about what I'm calling the architecture of fear. And you'll see that phrase has more than one meaning. Perhaps at the heart of this talk lies something of um, maybe even a slight difference in emphasis from that of the exhibition. Um, I, too, will talk about density and dispersal, but with what amounts to a particular reading in part of how it could be that this great architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, would in fact design a skyscraper a mile high um, and an earlier model, Broadacres, that would have emplaced, and here my estimate I'm told is slightly wrong, but nonetheless, would have emplaced something like 3,000 persons in households, each with an acre, at least an acre and a car, in an area roughly the size of Central Park. How could it be that the same great thinker and architect um, would have designed both, and are they in truth in tension with each other? Now, though I, I truly love the subjects connected to architecture, design, and urban space, uh, 
you will quickly see that what I have to say draws more on a historical and social science sensibility than perhaps most commentators or critics of these subjects. But as I move along in my talk, i be accompanied by three enormously influential companions. Wright, his sometime friend, Lewis Mumford, and Mumford's target of criticism, Jane Jacobs. And each, as you all know, thought very self-consciously about the city and urban design in social and ethical and not exclusively in aesthetic terms. And I take courage as I proceed um, in what I have to say this evening from the fact that the Social Science Research Council, the organization I currently lead, has in fact, as Reinhold said, has begun to organize a project called The Decent City. And I'll comment on that intellectual venture in a few, in a few moments, but for now, I want to acknowledge how working on that project with, among others, Richard Sennett, uh, Ricky Burdett, who heads the Cities Program at the London School of Economics, Paul Goldberger, and Diane Davis of Harvard's Graduate School of Design, how working with them has helped me understand better than I uh, certainly did some months back how a spatial imagination might illuminate matters of design, inequality, and group relationships, questions and issues that bear on the central subject about which I wish to speak, what is a decent city? Now, I immediately need some help because um, I'm not really sure where this much cited statement by Wright um, was first uttered or uh, appears. I, I searched but I failed as a scholar to find the source. But this, this phrase, uh, an idea is salvation by imagination, captures the spirit of my remarks because the idea of a decent city is a form of salvation through imagination. In thinking about what might be called the threshold conditions of decency, I want to probe how thinking about the city through the work and writings of Wright, Mumford, and Jacobs can help us consider the content of urban decency. Now, the idea of a decent city contrasts with other approaches to urbanism. How can the core characteristics of big cities be mobilized to make human life more just and democratic. Now, the SSRC's initiative on the decent city is premised on the centrality of urban space to human experience and the great challenges and opportunities produced by urban concentration across the globe. Now, proximity, what cities do if they do nothing else, is to concentrate people and functions. And proximity in physical space creates possibilities for remarkable institutional invention, economic advancement, robust cultural expression. But just the same density, just the same density, can facilitate adverse processes, congestion, isolated islands based on wealth and ethnicity, uh, segregation amongst groups, physical dangers of crime and uh, health contagion. So what is a decent city? Um, you'll see the citation from Richard Sennett in um, his uh, volume aimed at uh, instruction in universities of classic essays on the culture of the city, Max Weber, uh, uh, George Zimmel, Georg Zimmel, um, uh, and others. Um, in which he said there's one common quality to these essays, um, a, a, a turbulent search for a decent social order in the cities of our time. So what, what is a, a decent city? Well, the first thing to note is that we might contrast such a notion with two other depictions or understandings of uh, what we would aim at in thinking about cities. 
one we might call the just city. Um, reflections uh, on, on just that, on social justice, um, aiming at some abstract notion of a standard to which we should aspire. And at another end of a continuum would be the idea of a policy city, that is a city that is constituted by the aggregation of decisions, how we place and build the transportation system, how we build affordable housing or don't, or unaffordable housing, um, uh, how we get water to a city, how we get uh, sewerage uh, taken care of and the like. The idea of a decent city, it seems to me, spans both but sits in a field of tension between them. The term is meant to imply a site of reflection, research, and policy in a zone between more utopian reflections on the one side and highly focused instrumental policy considerations of the other. That is, not the just city or one policy at a time, but a middle zone in which the term decent city connotes places where built environments and the organization of space diminish and often s and soften various dimensions of inequality and promote relations amongst diverse populations that are neighborly. A decent city, in short, is a city that doesn't produce ultimate justice but guards against deep injustice and the potential of human beings to commit acts of depredation. And it's in that context that the triad of design, inequality, and toleration can be approached through a spatial imagination. Now the form, the type of reasoning that um, the SSRC project, and I hope my remarks this evening um, pursuing has a resemblance to the type of reasoning that John, the great philosopher John Rawls um, wrote about in a late career book, The Law of Peoples, something he called realistic utopias. Realistic, as you will see, because they could and may exist, but utopian because any a compelling such realistic utopia, as he wrote, joins reasonableness and justice with conditions enabling citizens to realize their fundamental interests. And he launched this idea in the context of writing about international relations. Um, and he tried to reason in what he called realistically utopian terms, trying to show, and I quote, how reasonable citizens and peoples might live peacefully in a just world. And what I think each in their own way, Frank Lloyd Wright, Lewis Mumford, and Jane Jacobs was doing, was trying to create both in the mind and in practice what might be called realistic utopias. Not utopias so abstract as to be so remote from human possibility, but not plans so concrete that they immediately would be instantiated and in some cases built um, here and now. This is a very particular zone. And as you move through the right exhibition on the third floor in the uh, next door, um, you'll see just that kind of realistic utopian imagination at work over and over and over again. And you see it at work in the criticism of Mumford and in the um, audacious um, writings uh, of, Jane, of Jane Jacobs. So my reflections here on The Decent City are reflections guided by that mode of reasoning, uh, this form of realistic utopia. And it might be noted that unlike his great landmark book, uh, A Theory of Justice, which is placeless and outside historical time, the later work of Rawls, both on global questions and on how people with incommensurable values can live together in a common polity, that later work is grounded in just such a search 
for realistic utopias. And this, as I've said, I believe to have also been the ambition of Wright, Mumford, and Jacobs, each in his or her particular way. So what I will be discussing is what might be called a clash of different realistic utopias with respect to the question, what is urban decency? What is a decent city? While assessing how moments of historical rupture and deep anxiety shaped the content and possibilities of these realistic utopias. Let's see. Now, this is not the work of Wright or Mumford or Jacobs. This is Poussin. Um, two paintings, two images of 1651. And I show these, I love these paintings, so the images are not as good as they might have been. Um, these, these hung side by side in a, in a Met um, exhibition of Poussin just a few years back. And sometimes you turn a corner in a room and you're faced with, with images and you just can't leave them. Um, and I spent a good long time looking at these at these images. Um, uh, they're not quite bright enough, uh, 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 alas, here. But what they signify for me is two different kinds of moments, two different kinds of contexts within which a kind of search for realistic utopias can and has proceeded and can and did proceed in the lifetimes of Wright, Mumford, and Jacobs. Now, these images of 1651 actually, uh, centuries later, proved a great inspiration to Cezanne um, as ways of um, apprehending uh, landscape and nature um, uh, as a, um, a source either of calm or deep anxiety. Now, what we have here in uh, the painting called Landscape with a Calm um, is an idealized Italianate landscape painted with, you can't quite tell from the slide, but painted with very fluid strokes characterized by tranquility. Um, persons at one with nature, billowy clouds, still water separating a goat herd from a cattle herd. And of course that contrasts with the image on the right, a harsh, threatening landscape with the ox cart in the foreground facing an emerging tempest. In the artist's words, quote, I try to paint a tempest on earth. And if you look at this painting long enough, you see terror, shock, fear, as persons try to protect themselves from a capricious and dangerous nature. And what I'd like to do is contrast different moments in which reflections about what is a decent city occur. Um, moments of design and imagination that are, as it were, um, on a, take place on a landscape with a calm, and those that take place on a landscape um, of a storm or a landscape that generates fear. Now, the issue of fear is, um, it's not a new one. Um, the, uh, I've, I just have a series of citations. I, I, I have, I collected these when I was writing my book, Fear Itself. I actually, uh, the digital age makes some things possible that simply weren't possible a short time ago. I could um, uh, download all of Shakespeare in about 38 seconds, um, and then in another 14 seconds, um, get every reference, every, every time Shakespeare used the word fear, fearful, um, and so on, uh, something like 230 times. Um, within an hour or so, I could, I could actually grasp every single one and think about what this complicated, awe-inspiring word means. Well, here are just four examples. Montaigne, fear exceeds all other disorders in intensity. Bacon, nothing is terrible except fear itself. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was not the first to use that phrase. Um, uh, Spinoza, fear is an inconstant pain arising from the image of something concerning which we are in doubt. If the element of doubt be removed, fear becomes despair. And Thoreau, uh, someone um, uh, Wright cared about, um, nothing is so much to be feared as fear. But why? Why is nothing to be feared as much as fear? 
Why does fear exceed all other disorders in intensity? These are not modest thinkers. Um, and they all came roughly to the same conclusion about despair. Um, well, I think there are three features of circumstances that generate fear. And um, I think we'll see in a bit why they're relevant to thinking about um, especially Wright, but also um, uh, Mumford and Jacobs. Um, in the chapter, I have a chapter in my book, Fear Itself, which is uh, called A Journey Without Maps. And I think um, that characterizes for me in three words um, what circumstances that are most fearful are like. Um, think about um, uh, ordinary risk. Um, uh, some of you may know a University of Chicago economist, uh, uh, Frank Knight, who lived a long time, but he wrote a very great book in the 1920s on risk and uncertainty. And um, he contrasts ordinary circumstances of risk, um, which we face every day. Um, we marry. Uh, half of all marriages today don't end well. But we marry notwithstanding, and we understand that we're taking a chance, but we understand the parameters within which that chance is occurring. We buy a house. Um, we think it's going to go up in value, but we've learned not, it doesn't always go up in value. But we think we, we have some grasp of the parameters of risk. We, we deal with risk on a daily basis. But fear is generated in circumstances that Knight calls unmeasurable uncertainty, when we can't assess the parameters uh, within which risk is, uh, is occurring. And those circumstances, the Great Depression, in, in the period in which I wrote in my book, um, think of not just the Great Depression of the collapse of capitalism, but the competition of the mass dictatorships in uh, Moscow, uh, uh, Rome, and Berlin, uh, each of which claimed they were better democracies than the Western representative democracies because they didn't have the polarization of politics. They didn't have an absence of public interest. They represented the interests of the working class, the Italian nation, the German race, better than a democracy, a Western democracy could. Well, there was the, the fear generated by that competition. Then there was the fear generated by the unprecedented violence ending with atomic weapons of the Second World War. And then there was the fear generated by um, the competition with the Soviet Union, just to take. Now, those circumstances, each one of those circumstances seemed unique and in many ways was unique. There was no status quo to lean on. There were no, no history of the parameters of risk that you could draw on to figure out where you were. And that generates fear. And not for nothing did Franklin Roosevelt therefore try to assure Americans they had nothing to fear but fear itself. But that wasn't quite empirically right, because they had lots to fear that was um, deep and real. So fear, from this perspective, um, analytically, has these elements of being as if a journey without maps, of um, being distinguished, uh, this deep anxiety moment or moments distinguished from ordinary risk and characterized by what Frank Knight called unmeasurable uncertainty. And fear can be thought of as um, situ generating situations in which fear acts both as context and as motivation. And I'm um, just repeating myself if I said again what's up on the, um, up before us, but one feature, important feature, which I think is as much true for people who do urban design and architecture as for politicians, as for economists, is that circumstances of fear widen the scope of conceivable models because the existing mode and way of working no longer seems quite adequate or achievable um, or des even desirable. And it's at moments of fear that we see the greatest ruptures, um, I think, in design. Now, you will see at the bottom of the slide a quote, a citation from a great political theorist, a Harvard professor, Judith Schlar, alas, who died uh, before her time, and she's famous for a concept she called the liberalism of fear. 
And it connects to what earlier I was calling realistic utopias. Um, what she said the task of political theory is, is not to invent the best or the most just world. Um, the task of political theory is to imagine such a world, but a world whose practical side must be geared to prevent the worst of human capacity, to prevent the evil of cruelty, and make that the basic norm of political practices. Designers and architects who design for the city, who possess the impulse of creating realistic utopias, typically, not always, are engaged in just that kind of effort to act not only to do something good and beautiful and potentially just, but simultaneously prevent something bad happening, um, uh, uh, human evil or depredation um, simultaneously. And we see there are various moments of scholars reflecting on this. I happen to like the diff two very different books, one very recent, um, uh, on the architecture of democracy um, by Alan Greenberg six, seven years ago, which is about the impact of the American Revolutionary War period on American architecture. And, um, and then a World War I book published in um, uh, 1918 by uh, Claude, Claude Bragdon called Architecture and Democracy. And what's striking about these books, as these are works of criticism, is how they reflect on the way in which moments of historical rupture, moments where uh, fear is generated by the, um, by the absence of routine risk, by the replacement of routine risk by circumstances that seem unique, how those situations shape and reshape architecture and design. So just as the example in uh, Bragdon's book, um, he, and I have no idea, I'm in a complete amateur here, whether he's empirically right or not, but he made the argument, which I find attractive, an argument at length in uh, three essays in that book, as to why it was that World War I and its moment of rupture um, transformed critical moments of American architecture from what he called an arranged neo-feudal uh, impulse to what he called a more organic architecture um, uh, based on the urgency of uh, finding a new kind of human aesthetic. As I say, I, don't, I, I truly don't have a clue about whether that's correct um, uh, with respect to, um, uh, you know, I, if I were grading his essay, I, I wouldn't know, essays, I wouldn't know what grade to give it because I don't have the empirical information. But I'm drawn to that, um, to that line of reasoning. Some of you will know Bragdon was an architect not of the stature of, of Wright or of his mentor, uh, uh, Louis Sullivan, but he was a modernist who had designed a good many public buildings, including Rochester's Central Railway Station. And interestingly, when we come to think about Wright, Bragdon was someone who abjured the individualist ethic of star architects and he aimed his work at supporting social integration and an inclusive democratic culture. Perhaps thinking less of right here than perhaps we might think of Mumford's and um, mum the bases and, and uh, underpinnings of Mumford's uh, uh, criticism. And, uh, but like Wright, Bragdon was drawn to, um, to design based on geometric patterns that he thought believed were drawn from nature. Now, let's turn um, now to, to uh, the key players in at least my talk, starting with Wright and, uh, and Mumford. Um, if we think about um, Bragdon's, um, well, let's, uh, if we think about Bragdon's thesis about the impact of World War I as a critical juncture, we might then also think about the ways the collapse of capitalism and the Great Depression of 1929 impacted both about how Wright thought about the city and how shifts in his thinking 
contrasted with his then friend, Lewis Mumford, um, they had a number of fallings out, including falling out about whether the United States might want to go to war um, against Hitler's uh, Germany with um, uh, Mumford taking an interventionist and right and isolationist position. In any event, um, uh, how Wright's thinking contrasted with Mumford's, who was playing a very active role at the time in promoting Wright's visions and uh, designs. Now, for Mumford, as for Bragdon, architecture was largely a social process with social purposes. And in his case, um, uh, architecture aimed at building a cushion against um, economic depredation. So at just this point, uh, Wright is publishing The Disappearing City, which was a manifesto for um, uh, radical decentralization, a, a, a book that heralded Broadacres, um, and where I said earlier, perhaps wrongly, 3,000 people on the scale of Central Park. Um, Mumford, at just this moment, is publishing The Brown Decades, in which he is promoting architecture as a social process, not an act of individual genius, and he stresses uh, the communitarian aspects of modern housing um, and fascinated with the models of social housing um, in Vienna, in Berlin, uh, Weimar Berlin, um, and in other uh, European places. And of course, we know that um, uh, later in his essay, Megalopolis is Anti-City, he criticized um, uh, Mumford's, uh, sorry, Wright's decentralization as an overcompensated protest against the reckless and indiscriminate congestion of the metropolis. Now, this contrast between the decentralized anti-urban right and the uh, communitarian, um, egalitarian, social uh, proponent of planned urban density of Mumford um, doesn't make have much purchase when we just move back a few years. Um, my favorite um, uh, design of, uh, uh, of rights, in the show at least, is um, uh, St. Mark's in the Bowery. Um, uh, the towers, three towers, um, well, sometimes six towers, sometimes one tower, um, but in this image, uh, uh, three towers that would have surrounded um, the church, St. Mark's in the Bowery, which you can see with a steeple that rises fairly high, but not nearly as high as these, as these towers, um, uh, that was designed, um, this brilliantly conceived design, um, brilliantly conceived in more than one manner, brilliantly conceived in terms of its very structure, um, uh, uh, which I, I won't rehearse here, but was an entirely novel way of building uh, an apartment house, which would have created um, uh, kind of floating apartments over the city um, uh, in a beautiful juxtaposition with floor plans not being identical one after the other. This is really, I mean, he was a genius, but this is truly a work of um, uh, great genius. Now, the, the Depression caused the loss of this project. Um, uh, this project, um, which you'll see I, I talk about incorporating density, not refusing density, but incorporating density, um, embraced urban scale and indeed incorporated density into the heart of the design. This is a very, very different approach, as we'll see, than Wright later took for his skyscraper that was meant to be a mile high. Um, now, this was commissioned by the rector of the church, William Norman Guthrie, a noted progressive um, theologian, and it was uh, commissioned to, to gain income for a fiscally pressured church. Those of us who spend time in Morningside Heights can now see a second apartment house rising on the grounds of St. John the Divine for precisely the same purposes. Alas, probably a bit less divine um, in the architecture than the buildings designed by, by, <laughs> by Wright. But the project, um, uh, like the work of Bragdon, but in a highly individualistic, um, original, remarkably original way, utilized geometry to potentially revolutionize the apartment house 
within a very tight, very dense, very concentrated location on the Lower East Side, which at the time was the densest residential community in the United States of America. Later, the same towers were moved to Broad Acres um, and placed a mile apart, not side by side, and thus their meeting was utterly transformed. But in pre-Depression New York, Wright embraced the city and its remarkable concentration of people, understood not as a mass, but understood as citizens, and the city understood in terms of its functions, including, in this case, spiritual expression. That project died with the Depression, an event that dramatically affected Wright's architectural practice, but also was the catalyst for a fundamental rethinking, at least from my amateurish perspective, um, in the move toward trans-urban utopianism. Um, a kind of realistic utopia, but a less realistic utopia than the one designed uh, here. And you might say, well, it was a utopian vision, the Broad Acres one, that um, uh, actually um, uh, heralded modern post-war suburbia. But I can't imagine that Wright was anything but appalled by um, uh, the disordered, um, ugly um, uh, features that often dominate post-war suburbia. So let's not make him the, um, the, the prophet of the, of the world we inhabit. Um, quite, the, quite the contrary, actually. In any event, um, before um, the Depression, Wright embraced urban scale. Um, he was very much an urban designer of central city building alongside his earlier work on such homes as Roby House, where I spent some time um, when I was at the University of Chicago. He embraced urban scale of the type celebrated in Hugh Ferris's um, uh, Modernist Metropolis of Tomorrow, the 1929 book that assessed the implications of zoning codes, new zoning codes for New York City. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that Ferris's brilliant drawings are held uh, in Avery Library at, at Columbia. So we not only have Wright's drawings, we also have these wonderful um, uh, drawings. And if you look at the key buildings, the, the, the not built, but uh, designed by Wright, the Call Building of 1912, I hope I have the year right, is it 12 or 13, Barry? 13. Well, 12, 13, what the, you know. But um, uh, I've got it wrong. But, uh, or the insur insurance building in Chicago of 1923. Um, uh, what you see is um, creative, original modernism um, in central business districts um, characterized by a radicalism of design and materials. The, um, the insurance building really had a pioneer in the, in the design for glass, for example. Um, uh, it broke with various, all kinds of conventions, as did the call building design. But the radicalism of design and materials um, still characterized a decent city as a city of high density and a city characterized by a certain separation of work and home, um, which had come to be um, a hallmark of uh, urban modernism. Um, now, then when we move to Broad Acre City and Mile High, um, something radically different um, is here. And you see it in the exhibition, these two great imagined utopias for decent living and working, one of dispersion, the other of unprecedented height and concentration of people and activity, are presented as representing a profound paradox of dispersal and density. Broad Acre took the towers of the Lower East Side to the countryside as part of an immense low density design. And as Barry Bergdahl writes in the winter 2014 issues of the Frank Lloyd Wright Quarterly, quote, liberated the tree from the overcrowded forest of Manhattan. And Barry continues by describing this one mile, I'm quoting, one mile grid of development without limit or final overall form 
that abandoned forever the idea of a center. And he describes it in the same language as Mumford used when the design was first revealed, the language of, quote, anti-city. That's a phrase used by, first, by Mumford. To this, Bergdahl contrasts the disposition of Wright when he designed the mile-high skyscraper for Chicago, a building meant to be fully 528 stories that would be connected by nuclear elevators, did I have that right, um, as being, quote, as much the prophet of the battle for height as he was the apostle of decentralization. The potential for unregulated sprawl, the pathological outcome of the broad acre vision, is distinguished from the pathology of, quote, a whole new celestial dimension for skyscrapers. So the exhibition, as well as that text, not without re good reason, stresses the differences. Um, what Barry Wright says, the, quote, basic tension between the extreme horizontal tension and extreme vertical reach. But for my part, as a you know, as, a, 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 as somebody looking at this um, uh, more or less for the first time, um, I would instead like to emphasize the similarities of these two designs, um, rather than their manifest differences, which of course exist. Ironically, Mile High, in my view, is deeply anti-urban. Um, it's a form of escape from density, um, a, an escape from diversity, an escape from challenges of toleration and inequality. Um, an escape, I think, from realistic utopias of the decent city. The base of the design is entirely surrounded by green. And there are other images you can see where Wright, which are not here, in which Wright presents mile high, this of the early 1950s, as surrounded by a Chicago that seems to have entirely disappeared. Um, uh, it's like one endless parkland. Um, a bit like um, Broad Acres, but now um, turned um, uh, on the base like Broad Acres, but otherwise um, uh, very high. And one, as a former resident of the city of Chicago, my impression, my question in looking at these images is where has the city gone? It's, it's a skyscraper without a city. Um, the city has completely disappeared, perhaps raised to restore nature. Here, there is not an architecture of fear, but fear of the city and urban denial. The stronger contrast is not between Broadacre City and Mile High, but between Broadacre City and the St. Mark's Towers of the late 1920s. The critical juncture of the Depression, this moment of fear, induced Wright to flee the task of creating designs for an architecture of fear, an orientation that would embrace and celebrate the city while guarding against its worst perils. Now then, very quickly, Jacobs and Mumford. Um, they, you see the, the image of the street that Jacobs loved so much, um, uh, and then you see um, uh, Mumford, who was a big advocate of um, urban planning, um, including um, the housing uh, uh, policies that were fashioned during the New Deal era in order to create social housing, European-style social housing in American cities. And that, the flight that, um, uh, from the city that uh, the post-depression work of Wright represented was rejected by both Jacobs and Mumford. Their disagreements were profound, but they were concerned not whether to practice an architecture of fear, but what kind of architecture of fear to practice. Jacobs, of course, as we all know, celebrated the small, the cacophony of the interactive neighborhood. Mumford, ever the planner, the quest for shared orderly spaces. Jacobs feared the implications of large projects. Mumford embraced them. And they both faced, after the war, a new critical juncture. 
a juncture marked by in cities like New York and Chicago and Philadelphia and Boston by massive demogra demographic shifts, a shift from a city almost entirely um, populated by second generation white ethnic immigrants um, to a first generation influx of color. And their designs, the designs of Jacobs and Mumford, sought to create realistic utopias to confront depredations of violence and crime, a new source of urban fear. These were um, very different analyses. They had very different analyses of the sources of the problem leading to different models of what I'm calling an architecture of fear. For Jacobs, of course, the, the, the central um, analyses were microscopic. Um, the level of the street, the stoop, the neighborhood, the local network, immediacy. For Mumford, um, they were the macro analyses. The fear was generated by large-scale social change. Um, and you see here the these, this is Mumford writing about um, uh, Jacobs in his famous 1962 um, uh, article. And let, let's just look for a second about what he has to say. You know, underneath the city, her thesis, the, that the sidewalk, the street, the neighborhood, and all their higgly-piggly, unplanned casualness of the very core of a dynamic of urban life lies a preoccupation that is almost an obsession the prevention of criminal violence in big cities. Um, life and death of great American cities reveals an overruling fear of living in the big city she so openly adores. And as all New Yorkers know, she has considerable reason for fear. And she writes of the increasing pathology of the whole mode of life in the great metropolis, a pathology that is directly proportionate. And these are now his analysis to its overgrowth, its purposeless materialism, its congestion, its insensate disorder, the very conditions she vehemently upholds as marks of urban vitality. So this is the nub of the difference between Mumford and Jacobs. They both see a city characterized by new sources of fear, unprecedented uh, in a way. This is where, um, uh, without anyone ever announcing it, themes of uh, race and disorder braided together in the post-war city of new immigration um, uh, make their appearance. From Mumford's point of view, um, Jacobs um, misses the macro sources of that pathology, purposeless materialism, uh, insensate disorder, congestion. And then near the conclusion says, the problem of policing public thoroughfares to prevent violence is minor. Violence and vice are symptoms of far graver forms of disorder than Mrs. Jacobs rules out of consideration because they challenge her rosily sentimental picture of the great American city. So let me draw to a conclusion um, uh, these dispersed reflections, but not entirely dispersed, because they're joined by the notion that some of the most creative thinking about design, about architecture, and architectural criticism have been generated under circumstances that um, the economist Frank Knight called unmeasurable uncertainty. And under conditions of unmeasurable uncertainty, brilliant people, Mumford, Jacobs, Wright, um, sought each in their own way to invent, create, and fashion new realistic utopias. Utopias that could, in effect, reduce fear to ordinary risk, to, to transform urban life or non-urban life um, into settings, physical and social, simultaneously, that could um, provide for decent living. In that sense, they all were at a quest for an architecture of fear. Now, we often think about um, architecture, and I am uh, about to close, as um, 
largely aesthetic um, in its question. As Mumford says, we look for places that take your breath away with the experience of seeing form and space joyfully mastered. And for a long time, he thought Frank Lloyd Wright was the, one of the leading um, uh, creators of just such places that, and as Wright was, places that could take our breaths away with the experience of seeing form and space joyfully mastered. Paul Goldberger, in, uh, in his book, Why Architecture Matters, that cites Mumford, um, uh, defines architecture as the making of place and the making of memory. The urban impulse is an impulse toward community, an impulse toward being together and toward accepting the idea that however different we may be, something unites us. I find that um, both inspiring and a bit too um, uh, hopeful. Um, uh, rather, what, um, what I think Wright, Mumford, and Jacobs all sought to do was not assume the idea of uh, one community, a kind of friendship model of, um, of our politics and society and economy, but rather understood that a decent city brings people together who may not like each other, who are vastly unequal, um, and who uh, um, have to find ways to live together despite that dislike and inequality. And the quest they made, each in their own way, for an architecture of fear was an attempt to grapple with that reality of the city. And I just want to close here by asking, how might we evaluate such efforts at an architecture of fear? And I just want to close by saying, I think of, of an evaluation that has to have four dimensions, and I'll end with a kind of CNN headline news version of these dimensions. Um, but perhaps in question and answer, we have a little time for that. Uh, we might discuss these. The first is the, is the level of structure. How do these, um, at least what I'm labeling the level of structure, how do designs for realistic utopias braid together the aesthetic and the social in forms, in actual structural realities? Second dimension is one of experience. How do these um, imagined structures promise to shape the experience of work and home and the transitions between them? And how, thirdly, do those, or secondly in a way, how do those structures also shape the dispositions of citizens, of citizens, networks, social groups, who, as I say, may not always like each other and may be vastly different in their um, income, their wealth, their skill set, their education. Um, how do those structures help shape those dispositions? One doesn't need to be a physical determinist to know that the way in which cities are composed um, has a constitutive effect on experience and on dispositions. And finally, full circle back to the image we saw at the beginning outside of St. Paul's in London. Um, how do different images or, or ideas that I'm calling ideas of realistic utopia uh, aim to affect possibilities for action, both individual and collective? And I think if we were to judge um, Wright, Mumford, and Jacobs by these four criteria, um, we could begin to open a potentially fruitful conversation. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, I'd be delighted to take questions if, if there are any. Uh, you don't have to dwell on this if you think it's too off topic, but since you mentioned urban and non-urban, I'm just wondering what you, what thoughts come to mind when you think of gated communities and stand your ground laws, which I'm reminded of when we think of the architecture of fear. Well, of course, gated communities are a, 
an attempt to solve the problem of fear, um, but they only make it worse. Um, so that's my very shorthand uh, answer to the question. Um, what, what was so striking to me about the, the Bowery Towers of, uh, of rights um, was that emplaced in the actual setting that they would have been emplaced with in, which is not just the setting of a church and a churchyard, which is at the intersection of the Dutch uh, um, uh, city plan and the, and the grid that was imposed on it, producing a very odd um, uh, urban site, but literally yards away from that church were tenements teeming with people, with immigrants, um, with diversity. Um, so the people who would have chosen to live in those towers, and those towers are likely not to have been inhabited, they would more likely to be inhabited by people who might choose a gated community um, than they would be inhabited by the people in the tenements around um, those towers. Uh, but um, that would have emplaced um, a, a, new, a form of, of creative urbanism inside the diversity, diversity and cacophony of the city, not outside of it. And it's that vision that I think is so, so very different than the post-1929 uh, vision that Wright began to, to, to put down on paper and in paper both in words and in paper of design and, and, and models of design um, for how, how we should live. Um, and I find that rupture um, just so fascinating and, I, and leads to a set of uh, worries or thoughts or conjectures about how the impact of fear destabilizes um, existing conceptions and can lead in very different directions, sometimes the direction of Mumford, sometimes the direction of Wright, sometimes the direction of Jacobs. They're not the same, but they're, they're generated by fearfulness and they seek what I was calling an architecture of fear, a way of taming uh, that circumstance to reduce it, as it were, to more ordinary circumstances of risk. I just wonder whether the, um, the architecture of fear that you lay out ultimately is an architecture that's anti-urban, right? I mean, that, that the, the urban models that you talk about after the depression in all three figures are all um, versions that sort of, uh, that essentially deny a certain scale and certain density and, and reify the idea of essentially the neighborhood or the community which is a, a village model or a decency, which I think, I, I guess my question would be, um, how do you avoid the decent city being tied, uh, not being tied to just the, the scale of the, the village or the neighborhood? Well, that, that's a great question. You've said something in, in asking the question that I had actually meant to say but didn't, namely that for all their differences, um, and you know, uh, Mumford wrote very critically about Wright. Mumford wrote very critically about Jacobs. Um, uh, uh, that for all their, their differences, they do share um, this strand of, of looking for um, either order or an ordered disorder um, that is a contained disorder. So the, the, the disorder that Jacobs celebrates um, is not a disorder that's threatening, it's a disorder that reduces threat, and there you need the small scale. Um, uh, uh, Broad Acre is obviously a form of uh, structured order, as is Mile High, um, but as are Mumford's plans, say, for social housing, or, 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 or right, all of them. Um, uh, but what I mean, I like, the idea of the architecture of fear, because I like the writing of Schklar. That is to say that we should combine imagination um, with a quest to pre prevent um, cruelty. Um, but I think, I think that the, the Bowery design, for example, of Wright, which embraced density, embraced complexity, um, embraced heterogeneity, embraced implicitly cacophony um, by location. Um, of course, it, it was a commission, but nonetheless a, um, uh, a proudly seized commission that alas never, ne never came through. Um, 
represents not the escape uh, to a village level or to somewhere out in a cornfield, but um, uh, an embrace of the city while reorganizing or uh, pioneering in its uses of design and space. And it's, and it's that impulse um, that, uh, again, just as a citizen of the city, not a specialist in these matters, um, I would hope would, would animate contemporary um, uh, urban design. Uh, the um, I'm not I haven't read Sklar, but uh, it sound it sounded to me like the idea of architecture fear was actually following a uh, sort of legalistic model. In other words, the ratification of everyday behavior or conflict and so forth, and the prevention or the defense against uh, you know uh, a low the uh, a essentially assuming that the worst will happen since a certain defense against the worst and the accommodation of sort of normative behavior based on a fairly low evaluation of the potential or possibility of, uh, which, is, which is what the only way law can operate anyway because it's actually just, you know, it's ratifying th th contentiousness in some way. So um, whereas from the standpoint of the architecture or the imaginative side, I guess, uh, it's not so much um, imaginative as speculative. So therefore, the speculative character of it is not a rear guard relationship. It's trying to, uh, it's, you know, I mean, it's just the difference between art and law, you know, that in a certain sense, art is speculative and law is conservative and rear guard. So, so those two things coming together are very interesting, but they don't, it's not going to, I mean, I'm not sure, it seems to me the legal side is winning in the argument uh, because it's, and that a certain sense, the speculative possibilities that architecture engages in, projective speculative possibilities, is, isn't going to be easily accommodated in that model. Well, th that, I mean, you've raised a huge set of questions, um, but one thing that, that is, um, I think, clearly true, is that when architectural imagination uh, seeks to move from, um, from drawing or models to doing, to, to, to building, uh, then it's uh, shaped and its possibilities are shaped and constrained by many structural constraints, some of which, in fact, are legal. Um, uh, codes of zoning, for example, or building materials, uh, uh, and the like, some of which are path dependent. Um, things have been already built. Um, so uh, you can't really do to Chicago what Wright imagined in his uh, mile-high uh, depictions of Chicago disappearing at the base. Um, that mile-high would have had to be emplaced in a very dense central business district or at the Gold Coast. Um, uh, so what I think you've identified is the, is the inescapable field of tension between uh, constraint and imagination. And what makes these utopias, as it were, realistic utopias, is that they work in and through those constraints. Um, and it's that kind of imagination I think we desperately need. Um, uh, we, you know, I, I've, part of the, the SSRC, uh, uh, incipient young program on decent cities is bringing to you, had, we have had a number of gatherings, small gatherings in which some architects and designers and sociologists and political scientists and economists, people who should be talking to each other but don't ordinarily talk to each other, have been in the same room. Um, and uh, in one or two of the presentations by architects, um, they look to me like pure utopia. Um, they were as if unconstrained. Um, what would my next design um, uh, look like? Uh, but if we really want to think about the role of design and building and architecture in, in what I'm calling decent cities, then this uh, dialogue uh, between constraint and imagination um, has to be front and center. And that's not I'm really now repeating myself. What I loved so much about Wright's designs both of the, of the towers, of uh, 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 residential towers, and also of the office buildings um, in the period um, 
uh, of the teens and 20s. And, and to me, that's his great moment of, of urban realistic utopianism, uh, not, not anti-urban realistic utopianism. Um, and it's also a moment when he's not alone um, in this kind of uh, imagination. It's also precisely the moment where the rules of building are being changed through democratic politics. Uh, New York zoning code, uh, for example, um, changes a lot in both the teens and the 20s. Um, and uh, the Ferris drawings I, I, I talked about were, were produced um, to show uh, um, architects how to imagine working within the constraints of the new law. Um, uh, and, and that kind of vibrant dialogue will always uh, occur. Find one footnote, because academics like footnotes. Um, it seems to me that, that this, um, this kind of uh, sensibility is also the hallmark of what some of the folks I had up on the, uh, on the screen were calling the relationship of architecture and democracy. Because democracy is a process of social choice. Um, and social choices are made that inevitably constrain, as well as empower, um, the imagination of architects and architecture. Uh, just quick, very quickly, um, I think it's backwards. In other words, I think okay. that the, um, I think that architecture produces the, uh, more constraints than okay. you could say, uh, you know, a a zoning law. I mean, the, the architecture is the reason why, you know, is in a certain sense, the reason for um, vast number of, uh, uh, of sort of new laws or new, new constraints or new ways of thinking about constraint and so forth, that it's not partly because it pushes out, but uh, you know, it, it actually is far more interested in expressing democracy in a sense than law is. So it's just, I mean, it's true what you're saying that obviously these things come into a uh, kind of uh, a kind of uh, productive relationship, or we want them to be in a productive relationship. But it's not really the free architecture against the sensible no. constraint. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly yeah, much subtle dynamic, yeah. Uh, much more complex uh, relationship, yes, I agree. You know, Reinhardt, it, it, it might make sense to take two or three yeah. in a bunch and then, um, yeah, yeah. Sure, I'll, great, and here's one, okay? The, the title of your talk is, um, is so deeply counterintuitive, which is to say the architecture of fear, because if I've, if I've gotten it correctly, you're, you're deploying that figure um, as, as a liberatory moment, a, a moment that gives rise to all of these magnificent and, and variegated um, speculative schemes. And what I'm, I want to link that to the present moment. And what I mean by the present moment is the post 9-11 moment. Aren't we in a moment of the architecture of fear? A, a terrifying moment that began on 9-11 and has continued now. We're in surveillance city. We're in a moment where cities have been radically redesigned to deal with fear and it's had a deeply constrictive and non-liberatory uh, formative and material effect. Uh, just following up on that, uh, similar kind of question, you said that at moments of unmeasurable uncertainty, I mean, new modes of working emerge. Uh, but I was wondering that uh, sort of examples that you showed, uh, Wright, Mumford, Jacobs, don't they, can't one say that they foreclose <coughs> the uh, sort of really confronting that openness by the category, by imposing or understanding all fear through the category of the city? Uh, precisely at the moment when the urban environment uh, in the U.S. is getting linked to the rural elsewhere in the world and other, uh, you know, in between urban rural uh, environments uh, and, and larger patterns of migration uh, and, and migrants, right? Uh, so all, all that category, all that turf, all those interactions that impinge on the category of the city and make it livable or viable are sort of erased from the view by imposing that we are only talking about the city. 
I'd like to see you get less abstract and closer to home, so my question is, does the Manhattanville campus <laughs> offer us a microcosm of a realistic utopia? Huh. Oh well, uh, okay. <laughs> Let, let's, let's start with the easier questions about fear. Um, <laughs> The um, e easier. Um, I, if I meant, if I was heard to imply or say that circumstances that generate fear in the sense of unmeasurable uncertainty um, are um, liberating moments, yes, I mean that, but I also mean that they're, si what I should have also stressed is that they're simultaneously dangerous moments. Um, uh, and also moments of potential closure, um, of escape, of, of not confronting. Um, I actually think that rights, um, uh, rights created an architecture of fear before the fear of the Great Depression in a more successful, liberating way by embracing the diversity and density of the city, um, something that got lost um, even in the brilliant absolutely astonishingly brilliant designs that were both a low density and then very high density and imagine mile high um, uh, 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 skyscraper. Um, and the, so the moments of innovation um, are, yes, moments of innovation, but they're also moments of, that can foreclose and limit as both, uh, both questions, first two questions um, implied. And what kind of moment are we in now? Um, actually, when I wrote this book, Fear Itself, I, I said early on that um, one of my motivations was um, wanting to find a vantage from which to think about the relationship of democracy and fear. That wasn't a book about design or architecture, but, but uh, compan compatible topics. Um, and the, um, uh, we are pressed again. Um, to live in and think about um, this very vexing relationship uh, between fear and other uh, key forms of social reality, including the nature of democracy, um, the limits uh, uh, of democracy um, in quests for security. Um, and that's not so very different than uh, ideas about urban design and space under conditions of fear in which questions of expertise as opposed to top-down, bottom-up questions, um, limits, whether they're limits of law or other uh, kinds of structures um, that reduce the scope for creative, uh, for creativity as opposed to expand the scope for creativity. Now, Manhattanville campus is yet, we're yet to see it. Um, uh, I actually think that, you know, Manhattanville was a kind of, um, remarkable gift to uh, a university in uh, a compact uh, big city. Um, it's 17 acres. It, there, were, there were, in truth, very few residents, a uh, few hundred um, in, on these 17 acres. It's a, a bit like, um, um, although it didn't look like um, Wright's design for <laughs> Broad Acre City, um, uh, it, it was the only area of New York City that had almost no residents. Um, and um, I don't want to say by hook and by crook, but by various means, um, it came to be possessed by my, our um, university, which has um, uh, uh, faced questions now of design. How do you design a, uh, a structure that is purpose-built for higher education while respecting the... Um, the density, the diversity, um, and various dimensions of inequality um, in the city. And um, one of the actually most um, enjoyable, if that's the right word, um, I, I spent a year um, as something called acting vice president for arts and sciences at Columbia, when just when Manhattanville was being imagined. And in consequence of holding that, that temporary job, I was invited to many planning meetings, including those with Renzo Piano, who's not a small figure in, in, in modern architecture, who had been brought on to think about 
um, what the structure of this new campus should look like. And actually, what I heard was a series of realistic utopias um, of uh, how to make uh, a, a purpose-built campus porous and open. Um, it had a lot to do with the use of glass, for example. I even had a moment where I asked him a question about different kinds of glass and was invited to a studio um, the next day where 27 different kinds of glass he tutored me about, um, uh, which were, to my untutored eye, they look like glass to me. I mean, um, um, but by the end of two and a half, three hours, I understood the way in which they refracted light, the dimensions of openness or non-openness, um, the implications for color, um, the way the buildings would be understood from the street, the way the buildings would be understood from the I inside, each were transformed. So my great hope, and I really don't have a clue if it's going to be realized, would be that that kind of sensibility over not just the building being built now, but the over the period of 20, 30, 40 years that Manhattanville will be filled out as part of Columbia University, will be guided by that kind of sensibility that I was calling a sensibility both of realistic utopianism and of an architecture of, of fear. Last round. Hi. Um, I was wondering if, in the interest of thinking with you, um, this uh, realistic uh, utopian, um, and taking it uh, maybe towards a more radical dimension, if we can, um, whether, if I can play the, the role of the technological determinist here a bit, uh, if we think of the high, high, uh, Mile High project uh, as also being the result of the nuclear elevator the possibility of thinking that building because of this elevator. Um, <clears throat> whether you see any potential in, in contemporary technology uh, to be disruptive in a political sense. Uh, and you know, there's many, many different uh, utopias that we could uh, uh, allude to here, but to give an example, the internet uh, and the many uh, cliche urbanism 2.0s that we, we hear about. Uh, not only uh, for the technology itself, but um, also to challenge an idea of democracy uh, as channeled through experts. Uh, you know, the idea of equal liberty uh, and the idea of democracy as not, not being something efficient, uh, but just being about equal liberty. One more? If there is, if not... Good. So let me. Well, uh, the, the, uh, this will be a very short answer. I don't know. Um, uh, truly, don't know. Um, uh, you know how we think about technology. Uh, it, it's a bit like circumstances of that generate uh, deep uncertainty. Every time there's a technological leap, say the current digital revolution in terms of the creation and production of knowledge, the continuum widens. Uh, uh, the good and the bad. That is to say, just, just uh, I don't begin to know enough about the technology of, 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 of building and construction to know where we are in terms of the explosion of possibilities of urban design. There are many people in this room who know far more than I, so I won't talk about it. Um, I already exceeded what I know. Um, but the um, uh, But if you just think for a moment about something um, I know a little bit more about, and again at the SSRC where we've launched a program called Digital Culture, which is about just the question of how techno this technological moment, which some liken to the Gutenberg moment, um, affects the creation and dissemination of knowledge. Looks like a straightforward question. It's not straightforward at all. Um, we have many new ways now um, uh, to fashion and create knowledge. Um, we just think of um, uh, the capacities for different forms of visualization, which you, of course, see in schools of architecture, but not only in schools of architecture. Um, uh, you see everywhere. You see it in departments of history at Stanford, um, which has a fantastic uh, visualization of American history uh, program. Um, and at the same time, you see connected to the very same technology um, an unprecedented um, form of openness, of, 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 of um, 
openness to um, communications, the ability to communicate, but now an openness that is not curated, that is not edited. Um, and in consequence, the kind of um, guardianship of quality, of standards, of the level of discourse which has been common in the age of Gutenberg scholarship, uh, book scholarship, and all kinds of practices like peer review and um, self-correcting mechanisms of the scholarly world can be bypassed very easily. So you can get both deeper and richer knowledge and simultaneously debased knowledge um, uh, as a result of the same uh, technology. And the question then for us is, as it would be for, for architecture and design, um, how to take those possibilities and genuinely um, think of them as uh, sources that generate uncertainty. Um, and then how to, how to reason about that uncertainty in ways which are neither, as I've said about in the talk, which are neither purely utopian um, nor too cramped and too narrow, but which join um, what is real to what can be imagined. And, and in a kind of persistent, um, open, sometimes cacophonous, cacophonous forum of or forums of consideration of where we are and where we go. And the very best work of Wright, Mumford, and Jacobs, to me, um, had just that spirit. And that's why I was so pleased to have had the chance to talk about that this evening. Thank you so very much. I want to invite you all out for what started out if it's chilled wine. It might now be German <laughs> Glühwein because it's much warmer out there. Uh, and I especially want to thank uh, Ira for his uh, openness to this. And I think it's very, very exciting when you work with a body of famous material and you work within your own disciplinary boundaries to have somebody come and offer a set of frames that are unexpected. Uh, and you can't go back to the material in exactly the same way. So that's a great gift to us. And thank you very, very much.